だね私たちがもう一年学校にいてあずにゃんと一緒に卒業できるといいんじゃないかってプレゼントは留年そう留年えうわえどうしたんですか別に明らかに焦ってますよねそうかなしかも今留年って言ってませんでした私たちにもいろいろあるんだよね Have you guys ever gotten to a point in your life where you felt the need to ask yourself how did I get here? Yeah, me too. It's been one year since I first talked about k o n and subsequently got pulled into this whole anime thing. That first video was meant to just be a one time deal, a way to celebrate both my brother's birthday and the fact that I came to enjoy a piece of media I couldn't stand in the beginning. Obviously, things changed. I had so much fun that I wanted to keep going, and now this medium has effectively consumed my presence on the internet. That's alright with me. I'm fine with going down in history. As the guy who turned saying nice things about Kyoto animation into a hobby. And as you probably guessed, that's what we're doing here today. I have some unfinished business with my old friend k a y o n here. In 2011, a film was released as the last part of the anime adaptation's run. I mentioned it, but I never went any further than saying, yeah. This exists. And while such an in depth analysis sounds hard to top, I'll be trying my best to do so regardless. The premise of this movie is a strange one. It takes place during the final episodes of season two, supplementing its own version of their events along the way. The biggest change is the addition of the band's senior trip to London. It's the main draw of the movie, and the fact that this trip was never mentioned by the source material means Kyoto Animation came up with the idea all by themselves. Which is weird. You'd think I think the logical thing to do would be to continue the story after the original four girls graduate, but clearly Kyoani had other goals in mind. I'm glad they did what they did though, because the deeper you dive into the purpose of this film, the more welcome of an addition to the franchise it becomes. But before we get to that, I want to touch on something that's far more noticeable to the eyes. For me, the aesthetics of k a y o n really stand out because of their fantastic blend of characterization and realism. Everything about these five girls. Girls, from the clothes they wear to the expressions on their faces, ooze character. Everything they do is done in their own special way. You can tell that an excessive amount of attention was given to fine tuning their actions to fit their personalities. It's the little things that build up your perceptions of them until they start to feel real in your eyes. Their individual quirks and the situations they get themselves in become memorable, and I can say that for a fact thanks to revisiting this film. Despite it being a year since I last watched, Watch this show, I still caught every single callback. Their performance of Please Give Me Wings, Mio's fall during the first school festival, Yui doing this circular strumming thing again, the fact that they're still choking themselves to death on tea and cake, I remember it like it was yesterday. And speaking of references, this is just Shiori from Tomiko Market. Let's not kid ourselves here. The amount of visual care put into the characters is also applied to the world they inhabit. This insane level of detail helps ground the show further. Further in reality, making it even easier to suspend your disbelief. This is especially true for this film's depiction of London. I've never been myself, but after comparing some photos and consulting some friends who have lived there for years, the consensus is clear. While the city of London looks a little more flowery and welcoming than usual because k a y o n must be k a y o n it does an exceptional job of depicting the sights and sounds of the UK's capital. It's hard to explain why something like this feels real while. Most other shows don't, but just like how the show handles characterization, I think it's in the little things. Creating 40 minutes of animation is a daunting task, and to add the caveat of using a real world location makes things all the more time consuming. Sure, you can go out and do your research, take a bunch of pictures, but who in their right mind would be willing to sit down and painstakingly draw every little thing their cameras captured 60,000 times? Well, I think you already know the answer. Answer, and the work they put in here really shows. I can't stress that enough, but big deal. Sure, everything looks great, but all that effort goes to waste unless the script holds itself to the same standard of quality. Thankfully, the writing in this film shows off k a y o n at its finest. It effortlessly pulls you into the shenanigans of the main cast, resulting in a film you can just melt while watching. This is thanks again to character moments and attention to detail. There isn't an element of this franchise's 
this anime adaptation that isn't blessed by these two traits. A good example for the writing side of things would be the way the characters behave the morning of their flight. They wake up at 4 in the morning to leave early, they try to scare their friends by pretending to lose their passports, they screw around in the airport while waiting for their flight, they stare through the cracks in their seats on the plane, they fight over whether or not the armrest goes up or down, they wait 7,000 hours at baggage claim only to find out that someone mistakenly took their luggage, the list goes on. I'm sure anyone who's been on a trip to an airport before can attest to doing one or many of these things during their stay. This forms a connection that builds a bridge between fiction and reality, allowing for the audience to feed off of the character's emotions and start having fun right alongside them. For those of you who were miffed about the show's relative lack of music despite its namesake, this movie has you covered with a plethora of songs paced evenly throughout, and the humor truly shines thanks to the aforementioned great character writing. I think my favorite is when Yui and Azusa are rotating through two hotel rooms looking for each other, and every time one of them knocks on the door, the music gets another layer to it. The only grievance I have with this script is with the pacing of its first act. It takes about 35 minutes for the group to start making their way to London, time that's spent setting up the premise and goofing around in typical k fashion. It feels like a normal episode from the show. Meanwhile, once the plane lands in London, you blink and then you're on the cab ride back to the airport. The time they spend in London feels significantly shorter than the time they spend at home, so I wish some of the unnecessary fat was trimmed from the first third of this film to match the increase in pace. And since I'm complaining, let's talk about Azusa. You are not who you were by the end of season 2 in this movie. She's always been uptight and strict towards the rest of the group, but some of her actions in this movie point towards a blatant lack of trust, something I find very hard to believe given that this is after both Valentine's Day and the final school festival performance. You don't sit and cry with your best friends because you're worried you'll never perform with them again, only to turn around and check your guitar case for a bomb after leaving it alone with them for only a few minutes days later. Would she do something like this when she first joined the band? Absolutely. But after two years of hanging out with these girls? It just doesn't make sense for her to do things like keep Yui at arm's length as if she's a serial killer just because she's acting weird. You know better than I do that she always acts weird. <laughs> Snake, try to remember some of the basics of CQC. It's a little distracting, especially if you're just coming off of Season 2, but let's be fair here. This is not Azusa's movie. Now, Season 2 has its fair share of serious moments towards the end, and almost all of them are shown through the eyes of Azusa. All four of the original members are moving on to college at the end of the year, leaving her to silently struggle with her impending loneliness. This explodes into her plea for them to not move on without her, and the song the original four wrote for her swoops in to put her fears at ease, to the surprise of both her and the audience. This movie's goal is to tell the same story but from the opposite perspective. Now instead of the song showing up unexpectedly, the entire story revolves around writing it. This new focus begins by creating a clear juxtaposition between Azusa and the rest of the group in order to label her as an outsider who isn't allowed to know what the plot of the movie is yet. The opener where the group pretends to be Death Devil to mess with Azusa is a great great introduction to this idea. There are plenty of other examples. Some are told like when the original four make an inside joke out of punning Azusa's name into their sentences, and some are shown like this shot where Azusa's mug clearly stands out from the uniformity of the other four. It's possible that they regressed her personality because of this change, because making a big scene like she did in season 2 might take too much of the spotlight away from the focus of the film. If so, I get why they did it, but you can still 
downplay her presence without changing her character. It's all in the way it's presented. They did it themselves when they cut to the outside of the school before Azusa could deliver her you guys aren't very good line. But regardless, with Azusa being pushed to the sidelines, it's only natural for Yui to take up that empty space. We got a taste of all the thought she put into this song at the end of season 2, but we're shown her entire creative process in this movie. I said it before and I'll say it again. Taking such an absent-minded character and giving her something so important to do that it's all she can focus on says more than words ever could. Even when they're getting chased by this 7 foot trench coat goblin, all she can think about is maybe I should call her a cat in the song because it'd be funny. And the best part is, almost every important decision is made by Yui. She came up with the idea to write the song, she directed every practice session, and she came up with the idea to use the angel metaphor for the lyrics. Also as a quick side note, showing clips of them rehearsing this song while they're performing it for Azusa was such a great addition, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get out of London before we talk about how well this movie conveys its primary focus in the third act. Once the plane touches down in Japan again, we're treated to a retelling of the events from season 2's final episode, and it does exactly what it needed to do. There's a fun little concert in the classroom to add yet another musical performance to the film, and the rest of the time is spent finalizing Azusa's song. There's the creation of the instrumentals, the rooftop scene where they get all nervous about performing, and the climax where they finally play for Azusa. I mean it when I say every little detail puts you into the shoes of these four characters. It's down to the point where they reverse the perspective of Yui's turnaround when they start playing the song. Remember last time when I said Kyoto Animation is very good at settling on a clear vision for their movies? K on the Movie is a textbook example of this fantastic talent, and it's the biggest reason why this is such a solid watch in my eyes. But with season 2 treading the same ground, where does that leave the movie in relation to the rest of the series? In the grand scheme of things, were they able to end off the Light Music Club story better than season 2 did. No. Hell no. Not even close. I doubt anything would have topped the original ending. Azusa's plight is far more compelling than watching the creation of a nice gesture for her. But you and I both know replacing season 2's ending was never their intention. This film isn't trying to be Kaon's disappearance or after story. You aren't going to come to some huge revelation about the series or gain any newfound respect for it. But even though this film doesn't have a reason to exist, I sure as hell am glad that it does. Because at the end of the day, it's more Kaon, and with a series like this, that's all you really need, isn't it? I admit, I like clowning on Kaon with my friends because it's funny, but since I'm free from the constraints of peer pressure here, I'd like to take the opportunity to say something genuine. I have so much respect for this series. It spawned its own subgenre of slice of life shows, which focuses on portraying life in a fun and charismatic way above all else, and it did it to near perfection on a first try. So much care was poured into every single aspect of Kaon that the state of the final product is just as heartwarming as the content itself. It's not my favorite subgenre of show. In fact, if given the option, I'd probably stay away from shows like it. But revisiting this movie reminded me why I always left K on wanting more. The characters, the writing, the music, the backgrounds, the relaxing nature of it all, it's, it, it's good. I know, I'm a broken record right now, but dude, it's just so well made. So go watch, rewatch, group watch, apple watch, whatever you gotta do. It's my brother's birthday today, I think he's turning 4, so it's your duty to show his favorite show some love. But make sure you don't skip out on the movie, because alternate timelines or not, it's still a part of the family. Thanks for watching everyone. See you all same time, same place next year when I... I don't know, I'll, I'll read the manga or something.